Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now ARM has released a whole bunch of new CPU and GPU designs and in this video we're going to be looking at the Cortex-A510. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so ARM has announced three new CPU designs, the Cortex-X2, the Cortex-A710 and the Cortex-A510 and there's also new GPUs, the G Mali G710, the Mali G510 and the Mali G510. 310. This video is about the A510, Cortex A510. There are other videos that I'm also publishing on my channel to cover all that other stuff. So what is the A510? It's basically the power efficiency core in a heterogeneous setup where you have power efficiency cores and high performance cores. When there are background tasks to be done, then of course the loads are pushed onto the uh, energy efficiency core. Doesn't kill your battery, but still gives you that performance that you need. Now up until now, we've been using the Cortex a55 that was of course the successor to the Cortex A53 so there's only three power efficiency cores really that we've had from ARM where of course we've had lots and lots of high performance cores starting with the Cortex A57, A72, A73, A75, A76, A78 I mean the just the list goes on and on and on and of course the reason for that is the power efficiency cores don't get updated that often but now with the advent of ARM V9 it was imperative that ARM release new processors across all of its range for ARM V9 including a new uh, power efficiency core so going forward no more A55 we're now going to have the A510. Now the big technical discussion about the A510 is whether it is an in-order CPU or an out-of-order CPU. An in-order CPU basically executes the instructions in the order that the compiler generated from the program that the uh, programmer wrote, whether it's in C or in Java or whatever it's been used. At some point there is a program that's being run and it does it in order. Now an out-of-order CPU gets greater performance because if it sees two things that can happen in parallel, if it thinks two things that are atomic and they don't need to rely on each other, they can happen at the same time, then it will start jumping around in the instructions that are coming up and saying, well, well while I'm doing that, I'll go and execute that instruction. Of course, that gives you greater performance. Now, the A510 remains as an in-order CPU, but the question is, could ARM maintain the power efficiency and up the performance if it's stuck with an, uh, an in-order CPU? And the answer is yes. Now ARM put out this information comparing the A510 to the Cortex-A73. So the A73 of course was a big core, 11 stage, out of order pipeline, advanced in its, uh, at the time, 2017, 2017. Now here we have in 2021, a Cortex-A510. And what can we say? Well, if you built an A510 processor today, and of course they are being built, it will be within about 10% of the performance of the Cortex-A73 and about 15% of the performance, so it can be clocked as almost as fast as an A73 could, but yet using 35% less power. So that means if you take a chip like, I think it's the Snapdragon 835, something maybe in a Pixel 2, Pixel 2 XL, and you had that phone from 2017 in your hand, and you had a modern phone with only the Cortex-A510 in it, no other big cores, today's phone will be almost as fast as that flagship phone from just a few years ago. That's absolutely amazing. This is the power efficiency core. So it does all that, gets within 10% of the performance while using 35% less of the power. So really, we've got a modern power efficiency core with great performance remaining in order. And this is what's gonna keep us going now for the next few years. Now, ARM do say that we don't have to wait another four years before we get a successor to the A510. There will be another one coming along at some point, maybe two years from now, maybe three. But of course, it's never updated as much as the big cores. But this one is giving us a good starting point for all the processes we're gonna be using over the next couple of years. So the Cortex A510 is a three wide in order design, as I mentioned. In order means you need to use less logic, less transistors to actually do all the fancy stuff that you need to do in out of order. So that really helps with the power efficiency. But as we saw, they were also able to boost the performance. And partly that's because they have been using some of the branch prediction and data prefetching technology that we actually find in the Cortex X program. So that has trickled its way down into 
to the 510. And one of the really interesting things about the A510 is this new merged core microarchitecture, which helps improve area efficiency. Well, let's have a quick look at that. So you may have heard of simultaneous multi-threading, SMT, or maybe you know it from Intel's brand name, Hyperthreading. So the idea that you have two CPU cores, but actually a lot of the stuff is shared. In fact, a lot of the stuff is shared. So really it's just one CPU core with kind of two entrances to it, two pipelines uh, into it. And I have a whole video here on this channel explaining how hyperthreading works. So if you wanna find out more, do go and watch that video. Now the merged core architecture is like that. I mean, it's a shared core, there's a merged core, but it's not really like that at all. So what is it? Well, basically two cores can be grouped together in a unit called a complex. Now in a complex, the main part of the CPU core remains independent, most of the stuff. However, there are a few things that are shared. The L2 cache is now shared between those two processors. The L2 LTB table is shared between those two. And here's the important thing, the mathematics engine. So this is the Neon floating point engine and the SVE2, the single instruction multiple data engine is shared between the two. So that means that when there is some heavy floating point stuff going on, there is the possibility of contention between the two processors. However, when all the other stuff is going on, loading things from memory, adding one, writing it back to memory, testing something this way, testing something that way, jumping another part of the program, all that is completely independent. But when they come to do some floating point stuff, there's one floating point engine. Now, of course, most code doesn't do floating point stuff all of the time. It doesn't hammer away the floating point. In fact, there are some different numbers around. It may even be as low as 3%, 5%, 10% of code is kind of floating point. The rest is the normal stuff of load and store and add and subtract and you know multiply and, and branching and all this kind of stuff. So the merge core architecture doesn't actually merge too much of the devices, just merges that SVE2 engine. And what that does doesn't increase the performance, but what it does do is in, it saves on area. So when you have a particularly price sensitive market where you want to have the lowest possible price for a smartphone, for even for a tablet, or even for a laptop, then this could be a way of saving money by merging these two cores together. In fact, ARM say that under some floating point benchmarks, because the access to this thing is so granulated, you might only see a 1% performance decrease when both cores are really, really hammering away at that floating point unit. Other than that, they kind of operate independently. Now, the good news is you don't have to build the A510 like this. You can actually build the A510 just one CPU core per complex, so it's nothing is shared, no L2 shared, no uh, floating point engine shared. So it's perfectly possible to have an octa-core A510 with no shared logic between them. It's also possible to have an octa-core one where you have four complexes and there are two merged cores in each one. Really does depend on what the OEM, the chip maker, Qualcomm, Samsung, whoever, MediaTek, how, how they want to build it. There's a flexibility there, but in the difference is area saving costs. So that's gonna be something I don't think we see in the latest Slapdragon, in the latest Exynos, but it may be something we see in the lower tiers to help bring down the costs. Now what's interesting about this is that ARM have been playing around with this idea internally since way back to the Cortex A53 and the A57, that kind of time frame. And in fact, the A510 as a process of the first discussions were about it were, were way back in, in 2016. So this just shows you how long it takes to design and bring to market a modern, uh, powerful, power efficient uh, CPU core. So just a few other things to look at the Cortis A510, 128-bit fetch cycle, three instructions per cycle can be decoded, that's versus two per cycle for the A55, so an improvement there, better branch prediction as we mentioned earlier, three wide decode, three wide uh, integer ALU pipe, and then there's some other improvements to the load and store caches that allow a greater increase in bandwidth. In fact, in the L1 cache, up to a four times increase in the cache bandwidth compared to the Cortex-A55. One other big difference between the Cortex-A510 and the A710, the X2, is that in the A510, because SVE2 is scalable, that's what the S bit at the beginning means, you don't have to implement 
the vector maths in 128 bits or 256 bits. You can do it in 64 bits. So there are two variations of the Cortex-A510, some using 64-bit uh, sca uh, scalable vector engines, some using 128-bit up to the OEM again to decide, saves on area, slight decrease in the performance. But of course, these are important decisions they make. But then if it's coupled with another core, like the Cortex A710, uh, and of course it's got a full 128-bit uh, SVE2 engine in it anyway. So again, there's always that possibility of migrating across to different processors to run different things. One other thing worth mentioning, like the X2, the A510 is a 64-bit only CPU, and I am planning a video called 32 Bits is Dead. So look out for that video. So 64-bit only processor, the uh, A510. And so here is a graph representing what we could expect from the Cortex A510. As you can see at the lower levels of power, tracking really with the Cortex A55. But as things start to uh, get harder, we're seeing that the uh, A510 offers more uh, performance with less power. In fact, for the same performance as the uh, A55, you're using less 20% um, uh, less power, or for the same amount of power, you can get 10% more performance. So double digit numbers here in terms of energy efficiency and in terms of performance. So we can expect to see the A510 coupled with the Cortex A710, maybe in a four plus four setup. We can also expect to see it coupled with the X2, maybe in a one plus three plus four setup. And of course there is the possibility of just a quad core, uh, A510, an octa-core A510. That was certainly a popular configuration with the A53, not so much with the A55. Be interesting to see what the chip makers make, haha, <laughs> the chip makers make of the uh, A510 when it comes to deciding how they're going to put it together. Of course, you can have a quad-core version with just 64-bit SVE2, two complexes sharing some of that stuff that will reduce the area, but yet still give us a relatively powerful processor for, for low end, even for, you know, for wearables, even set-top boxes, and of course, some types of smartphone. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. As I said, I've got videos on the X2, on the A710, and all on all those new Mali GPUs. So if you want to make sure you see those, do subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification icon. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.